So what I'd like to do with the rest of our time is explore how in the lives of a handful of pretty extraordinary people that happened in the expression of their faith. How they, they practiced faithing and trusting and more, what the gifts were. And this really is an invitation to sense in our own lives this possibility of a kind of a surrendering more into the what is. And as I'll talk about, it's not a, it doesn't lead to passivity, it actually then allows us to live with a real spontaneity and creativity. Okay, so one of the first gifts of faithing, of this entrusting, is that we, in the moments that we've kind of surrendered and there's more of that porousness and fluidity to that spacesuit self, our natural intelligence shines through very, very strongly. When we have this healthy faith, this faith in true belonging, then we just open to this universal intelligence and it comes through. Example of, for you tonight of that um, is the life of Harriet Tubman. And, and many of you have heard of her, just, so I'm not going to speak a whole lot, but just to say that she was an African-American at the time of the Civil War, was known for her bold role in aiding slaves to escape um, through the Underground Railroad. And so her, if you had to say, her place of faithing, of finding belonging was she gave herself to work for the freedom of enslaved people. She gave herself to something larger. It took her out of that spacesuit self and it gave her access to something really phenomenal. Because as I, as I learned more about her life, she took trips every year into the South and of course she was in danger. She was, they had a lot of money on her head. But she took these trips into the South. She had an uncanny way of finding her way to where there were different groups of fugitives ready to go north. She'd take ten at a time. That's a lot of people to sneak through all the authorities that were armed and ready to kill. And she had a legendary second sight. She was able to anticipate where people were going to be and be able to, you know, find, guide these fugitives through these hair-raising situations, narrowly escaping capture. And they actually had, she had the reputation of being guided by angels. So what was described about her, she had no military training, but she had this capacity to come up with these brilliant, creative responses to situations. In other words, her intelligence was adaptive, and that is the key in an evolutionary way of the highest level of intelligence, an adaptive intelligence. She was creative. I could speak a lot more about her because I think she's an amazing, fascinating character, but she had faith. She entrusted herself to this uh, work for freedom. She entrusted herself to God and for her God was that intelligence, that spirit, that love that guided her. Totally entrusted it. So she just listened. That's how she knew what to do. She listened. This is not a passive faith. This is an active faith. Now, Albert Einstein, very different kind of thing, and I, and I won't speak much about him either, but he and a number of other scientists that made some of the most radical breakthroughs in, in history had the same sense that it was when they quiet, they had to do a lot of rational thinking and they had extraordinary logical rational minds. And it was in the moments that that went to the wayside, the rational thinking quieted and there was a kind of intuitive sense that the most uh, dramatic breakthroughs and realizations happen. Now Einstein described this as intuition. It's the same thing of, in, of faithing. He just would kind of let go and entrust himself to that presence so that intuition could come through. And here's what he wrote. He says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. The way we access that gift, it's a letting go of control. You know, we spend so much time trying to figure things out. It's 
in trusting ourself to presence, stop figuring out. Let go of the thinking. Just open to what's here and there is an intuitive knowing that can come through. We see the same creative intelligence in artists. And in, in artists it's this kind of full giving, surrendering into their work. And the example that kind of captured my interest was Keats. He, he's a pretty dramatic guy. Um, and Keats started off very ambitious as an, art, as an artist actually, he wanted to be the best. And many of you might know he died when he was 25. So he, he hit his luminosity as, a, as this amazing uh, writer and uh, poet uh, right before his death. And he had a sense of moving from being this ambitious poet, the doer, the one that was going to really write things, to being an instrument. He surrendered himself in a way. And here's how he described it. He called this negative capability, which means rather than controlling this willingness to live in uncertainty. Okay, this is faithing. This capability of surrendering, and he calls it annulling the self. In other words, coming to that place that is not bound by the self, enlarged beingness. So his practice was much like what we describe as unconditional mindful presence. He talked about embracing all the different facets of life. We talk about the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. For him the language was to bear all naked truths. Sometime before he died he anticipated his own death and in anticipating his own death and opening a surrender of ring presence to that being okay, that's when his poetry reached its peak of creativity, of luminosity. He wrote, the world of pain and troubles is necessary to school an intelligence and make it a soul. The heart must feel and suffer in a thousand diverse ways. And then as his biographers describe it, he embraced beauty, change, loss, and creativity just poured through that openness. So do you get a sense of how the world opens up when we do this kind of a surrendering presence? a sense of opening to what's larger than our stories, our self, our self-concern, we also open to the creativity and intelligence that lives through this universe, the soul of the whole. Okay, so we've talked about intelligence. Another capacity of faith, of faith thing, is love. That's what flows through too. And example that just say a bit about is the Dalai Lama who again and again has had this kind of openness to what happens, this kind of surrendering, open presence. And he enters a stadium of a thousand people and you can look around and people start crying when he enters a stadium because he's such a pure expression of an open heart. And we long to sense that. And so our heart opens, it's contagious, we open when we sense them. I remember in California, um, he, at one point he was at a hotel where there was a conference and he asked to meet with all of the, um, everybody that in some way had helped make it possible, including the janitors and the women that had cleaned the rooms and the cooks and everybody, so they all stood in this long line, including all the secret service men and everybody was in this long line. One by one, one by one, he bowed to them. And with each one it was that same thing, that this, what was coming through was this just really unconditional presence. Each person felt special. And I can attest to it myself because I've been in one of those lines with him and given him the kata, you know, which is a devotional gift. And those moments that he was, he just was right there. What lets us be right there? It's when we're not 
preoccupied with taking care of a self, defending a self, proving a self. So, intelligence, love. There's another quality to faithing and faith, which is, you can feel it in the term, the lion's roar, which is, there's a certain kind of power or empowerment that comes through. It's like we open to the power of the universe. And uh, I'll I'll talk a little about Gandhi on this one. Again, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book that's going to be coming out in about six months, and he tuned me into some of these uh, figures and some of the aspects of their life. His name is Stephen Cope, and his book is called The Great Work of Your Life. And uh, I I endorsed it, and really, um, when it comes out, I'll talk more about it and have it on the reading list. So I want to give credit to Stephen for kind of attuning me to some of these lives and biographies. Okay, so Gandhi, as a young boy, he was skinny, he was bullied, and he was scared. And he was so scared that finally uh, one of the family servants got really fed up with him. And he said, look, and she said, look, it's okay to be frightened. That's okay, you can admit you're frightened. But when you're afraid, don't run away. When you're afraid, stay. And in your mind, just say, Rama, Rama, Rama. Rama is the name of God. So she taught him, in the face of fear, to stay and to take refuge. And here we're calling refuge Rama, this loving presence. He, he grew through his life, he, he was known to be constantly, constantly reciting Rama, Rama, Rama. So his life became more and more belonging to God belonging to spirit. And as many of you know, that when he was shot, when he was assassinated, that was it. He said, Rama, Rama, Rama. So courage and a certain power, because when you have that courage, you're free to act. And you're free to act in a way that brings a tremendous amount of passion and clarity. So for Gandhi, the way he described it, was that, that you reduce the self to zero and become an instrument of soul force. You reduce the self to zero through this faithing, through this surrendering. Whether you call it surrendering to presence, surrendering to God, to Rama, to love, it's through that surrendering, that letting go, emptying out the selfing, all the defendedness, you become an instrument of soul faith. What a beautiful image. So Gandhi, you know, he says, be the change you want. He inhabited that. He inhabited that kind of empowered beingness. And um, you can sense, you know, they talk about faith moves mountains, that his, his entrusting himself, that trust, gave him the power to just do things that were incredibly creative. And like Harriet Tubman, he was completely unpredictable. Like the English said that they they couldn't work with, oppose him because every time they'd think he'd be in one place and do one thing, some intuitive twist would happen and he'd come up with another strategy, another campaign in another place. They could not track the guy. There was a creative brilliance. What allows us to have that creative brilliance? when there's not that interference of the selfing. I think when I um, was reading about Gandhi, what came to me was uh, Goethe's famous, very famous quote about commitment, because this entrusting, when we entrust, it actually gives us the energy to really commit ourselves. And I've run into so many people that, in a way, they, they're getting older and older and they're saying, you know, I have never really gave myself to what I loved. I haven't really committed myself to creativity or to loving or to letting in love. So, here's the quote. He says, Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back. The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. Whatever you can do, or dream you can do, begin it. 
Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. I was talking to uh, a very dear friend a few weeks ago and she was sharing her insecurity in a relationship she's in with someone and how she in some way, even though she mostly mentally knows there's love there, at times she gets tight and can't really trust this person really loves her. There's a, a sense of not deserving, I'm not worthy of it, you know, it just it couldn't really be, which I think a lot of us can relate to, that to the extent we're caught in our egos and our fears, it's very hard to really get it, like really let it in, let, let our hearts really feel bathed, feel held and loving, very hard. So this is what she was talking to me about. And because I was, we're really close, I made a more direct suggestion, which was, on this one, take a chance. Take a chance that you can trust loving. Take a chance. You know, whenever we're faithing, whenever we're entrusting, there's a sense of chance. I mean, the ego wants to protect. Entrusting is to let go of our strategies. This doesn't mean all the time in any situation that we have the uh, balance or inner stability to let go. Sometimes we need to hold on to our strategies, and that's compassionate too. So I'm not trying to give an all or nothing kind of invocation to letting go. But it is possible for each of us to find where our edge is and soften some. And for her to take the chance, just to take the chance that you can trust this loving. So later she returned to me and said that those phrases kept, you know, rebounding in her mind just to take that chance. And we're talking like, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? You know, to not open to that possibility, to stay safe, to stay in our little comfort zone that's really pretty lonely because we're not letting it in. So I just wonder if you can sense in your own life, just for a moment, um, where you would like to take a chance and entrust yourself more to, to life, to aliveness, to creativity, to loving. You know, just to reflect on that for a moment and to sense, well, what would it mean for you? What would be challenging? And can you sense the, the longing, because I think it's a longing really, to take another step in that direction, to take a chance. Hmm. Aww. Yeah, you don't have to take a chance on, just, just the rest of us. <laughs> so you can just be held, you know. <laughs> We're blessed to have a young one with us. Yeah. So what happens is there's a positive spiraling that when we take a chance, and we just take as much of a chance as we can in this moment. This moment you might think of a situation that's difficult and just sense, okay, I'm going to be, let myself be a little more forgiving of myself or a little more open to this person or take a risk here or go ahead and be creative and not necessarily meet somebody else's expectation. You might have something like that. And you just gentle yourself into faithing. You know, you don't have, it doesn't have to be a shove. In fact, it can't be. So there's this positive spiral that when we feel our edge and soften and entrust a little bit more, we touch something, some space, some presence that we know feels like home. It has that feeling we were chanting, ah, that you kind of let go into and you sense something you belong to, some enlarged sense of being. And that then deepens faith so we can do the faithing more. And it's a spiral of surrendering and then surrendering the surrendering until there really is a sense that the ego can play itself but we know who we are that is um, absolutely mysterious and unconfined and loving 
and aware. We just know that. That's our home. That feels more true than any story about ourselves. Then faith really is a radiance. Then we have a heart that's ready for everything. So, this is the last piece. So I've mentioned the gifts of faithing and of faith. I've mentioned intelligence and I've mentioned love and I've mentioned that empowerment to really be part of the transformation, to serve healing. The last piece I want to mention is um, a kind of freedom, a taste of freedom. The Tibetans call it that you can live your life like a child of wonder. You know, so many of us go around and see problems, like life is a problem to solve. And as the now it's out there kind of quote goes, it's really a mystery to be lived. Really, you know, it's really a mystery. And if we go around and there's a sense of wonder, we're expressing that freedom and that faith. Child of wonder. So my example of that, uh, there's a book called The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. And in one part of it, he's visiting a lama in a very remote, very secluded part of Tibet, very isolated. And this lama has crippling arthritis and he knows that the lama will never again leave his, his place, his monastery, because he just wouldn't be able to walk and do it. And he wonders what it would be like to know you can never again leave a place. So he the question comes out to this lama and I want to read you the response and this is how uh, Peter Matheson writes about it. He says, and this holy man of great directness and simplicity, big white teeth shining, laughs out loud in an affectious way at the question, indicating his twisted legs without a trace of self-pity or bitterness, as if they belonged to all of us. He casts his arms wide to the sky and the snow mountains, the high sun and dancing sheep and cries, of course I am happy, it's wonderful, especially when I have no choice. (laughs) Isn't that great? Of course I'm happy, it's wonderful, especially when I don't have any choice. That's an expression of the controller has been dissolved. He's no longer identified with that smaller self that needs to control. He's living in an enlarged belonging. Of course he's happy. Mm. So to say as a part of closing that um, this is not to set yet another far off goal that we're going to surrender our lives and, you know, never control and, you know, live in this bliss. It's more of a sense of this is what's possible and we don't have to wait. What's possible is you can find in your own life the places where there's some yearning to be more free, some yearning to love and be less defended, some yearning to be more creative some yearning to not live inside the box of your own or others' expectations, to feel more creative in that way. And let that be the edge that you experiment with. Sense what happens if you take a step and if you do take a chance to let love in, to express love, to live this moment more fully, even when part of you wants to figure something out and do something else, to go ahead and not turn away from the fear, to stay. And your way of, instead of Rama Rama, might be to stay and in some way put your hand on your heart and say, you know, sweetheart, it's okay. Or it might be in some way to to offer it to Kuan Yin, or it might be in some way, okay, this is just fear. It's fear. And there's more. Whatever your practice is, to play your edge, to take a chance, and then to find that the gifts are a more free life. Okay, so we're going to do a closing, just a very brief sit. And what I'd like to do as a way of, um, of leading into the sit is I'd like to close with a very 
lovely poem from Mary Oliver. So just let yourself come into this pause. This poem is called Hallelujah. Everyone should be born into this world happy and loving everything. But in truth, it rarely works that way. For myself, I've spent my life clamoring toward it. Hallelujah, anyway, I'm not where I started. And have you too been busy? Have you too been trudging like that? Sometimes almost forgetting how wondrous the world is and how miraculously kind some people can be? And have you too decided that probably nothing important is ever easy, not say for the first 60 years? Hallelujah, I'm 60 now and even a little more and some days I feel I have wings. By opening into this moment of presence, you opened a possibility. Relaxing into the moment, whatever's here. Kindness to the moment. letting go into this changing flow of sound, sensation, letting go into this heart space. honestly sensing the experience of the heart with a tremendous tenderness, tremendous tenderness. Letting go can't happen unless we're kind. Faith begins with a prayer, that longing to open to who we truly are, to trust who we truly are, to live from that loving presence. So in this last moments of silence, just to feel your own words, your own prayer, for your own being, offering yourself blessings. extending this prayer to hold the whole world in our hearts. May all beings entrust themselves to loving presence, realize their very nature as loving presence. May all beings awaken and be free. Namaste.